This is Psalm 118, verse 19. Here's what, here's what God's authoritative word says to us. It says, open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So we're gonna to sing together. We're gonna to clap together. Let's rejoice in Jesus. Let's sing together. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning. See, my hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils, when darkness veils my Savior's face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand he's promised to be with us the singer is over his oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope. let's sing it today on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand We sing it when he shall come. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is seen. All of the ground is sinking sand. Well, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Let's give our God praise today. You know, normally when we start our services, I'll usually read a passage of scripture and then encourage us to sing. So we're changing things up a little bit this morning. I wanted to read that scripture um, to remind us that this today is the day that the Lord has made. Um, so we're gonna rejoice. And the reason that we gather together and we sing is not just for an us and God, or a me and God time, but it's for an us and God time. So we're reminding each other uh, that God is the creator of the universe. We're reminding each other that Jesus is Savior, 
Um, so maybe, this may be true for some of you. You have never sung more than a whisper on a Sunday morning. Or maybe you think, man, the person next to me doesn't wanna hear me sing. I wanna encourage you, this morning, sing. Uh, not just for yourself, but sing for everybody else in this room because we need to be reminded of the truth. We need to feel the truth of these songs. That's why we sing, that's why we clap, that's why we remind each other of the gospel. So we're gonna sing today. Let's sing these truths um, and remind each other of it. What love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more our god's patient with us what patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord His mercy is more stronger than darkness, new every morning. Sing our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What riches. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. So praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Oh, we sing it today. The stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Sins they are many. His mercy. Come on, we sing it today. Our sins they are many. His mercy is more. And our sins they are many. His mercy is more. Come on, let's sing that chorus together. We praise Him today. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more Now let's praise Him today. Like you, there is no other. And 
true delight is found in you alone. Your grace, a well too deep to fathom. Your love, your love exceeds the heaven's reach. Your truth, a fount of perfect wisdom. this morning. Well, thank you guys for worshiping with us. Let's pray. Father, we just, we thank you for just being a very present help to us through all things, Lord. You are with us and you are sovereign. Um, every, every minute of our life is in your hands, Lord, and we can trust you that you are good. You have redeemed us. Lord, we thank you for just these songs to be able to, to worship you with, to just remember your truth together as a, as a church body, as the body of Christ. Lord, and we just ask that you would make your truth um, even more clear to us this morning. That we would just sit in the grace that you offer through Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you saw our desperation in our sin, and you didn't leave us there, Lord, but you sent your son to save us. We praise you for that this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, you guys can go ahead and have a quick seat. Um, my name's Mary, and if you're new here today, just thank you for joining us. Um, we love seeing new faces here. And um, right now the kids can be dismissed to their classrooms. They can kind of head out that back door there. 
And the kids are gonna have a lot of fun today um, and they're gonna be learning about, about scripture, about the Bible. So today they're learning about Moses um, in Exodus chapters one through four. So if you are a parent, um, we love to you know, let you know what your kids are learning about. And, um, and so they really are, they're learning the gospel, they're learning scripture. Um, if you would fill out a connection card, um, that would be great. You can find these at the Next Steps tent out in the courtyard. This is just a way for us to connect with you and to get to know you um, and answer any questions you might have about, about Gray City. Um, we also have our cafe outside, so we have free coffee for you. Um, usually there's some snacks, some goodies out there. So all of that is, is for you. Our cafe team does an amazing job just stocking that for you so that you feel more at home and more welcome. So make sure to grab some of that. And um, right now we're in a time called family family time. This is basically a seven minute period where we would love for you to just meet someone new, um, have some good conversations, and, um, and then meet back here in seven minutes for the rest of service. So you are free to break. <laughs> When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any as they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will empower Randall as he comes and uh, speaks your word to us and pray that our hearts will be open and receptive to hear, hear what you have to say for us. Um, God, teach us about yourself and uh, about the world you made for us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Amen. All right, thanks, Ethan. All right, good morning, everyone. All right, just like Ethan said, if you got your Bible this morning, we're gonna be in Genesis chapter six. And um, you know, I was just want to, I, I wanna say that this past week, it was really encouraging as I went into uh, our local Starbucks here off of Governor, and it was Friday. Um, so I'm getting my, 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 my drink, and I turn around, and I saw uh, three guys in the corner studying the Bible together. Um, which I thought was awesome, you know? And so one of the things that we talked about this year is just being in the Word of God, being, reading the Bible. Um, so if you haven't jumped in yet, you don't have a CBR journal, tell us. We want to get you one uh, because we want to all, as a church, be together reading through books like, like Genesis. And so uh, we're going to be continuing in our series, The Gospel in Genesis, and uh, if you're new with us, um, the, the word gospel just simply means good news, uh, good news. And so as we look at the Bible, we see the word gospel throughout, and you see it all the way through in Genesis. And we're looking at specifically today the life of Noah. Uh, this is kind of the setting of, of Noah's life, and uh, we're in Genesis 6, 1 through 8. And what we see here is the wickedness of the world. Right, we've talked about it before in Genesis chapter three where there was a fall that happened and now we're seeing the, the effects of sin all the way to Genesis chapter six. Um, and so here's the message today. As we look at this text, what do we pull from this? Uh, well, it's this, a reason for hope. A reason for hope, right? Like what's, what's the, the hope in this passage today? Because as we look at what the, the hope is, then I think that's where we're going to find that gospel thread, the good news that we need to hear today. Uh, in 2007, uh, Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor wrote an 896-page book called A Secular Age. Now, this book describes our world today. And the book specifically has been a hot topic for many theologians, philosophers, and columnists. Uh, Taylor's book tells of this cultural shift that has taken place um, the past several centuries, and that today, because of the influence of secularism, we no longer believe in God or the supernatural. And he calls our world now uh, disenchanted, 
disenchanted. Uh, but as, as much as we have adopted uh, Nietzsche's declaration, God is dead, and have tried to subtract the supernatural from our everyday lives, Taylor says we still can't shake this sneaking suspicion that we are missing something, that we're missing something. Taylor says, don't you feel it? Don't you have those moments of either foreboding or on the cusp elation where you can't shake that sense that there must be something more? What he calls this is the haunted imminent. This emptiness, this hole, this, this thing inside of us that says there's, there's got to be a God. There's got to be something more. See, it might be the very thing that brought you here this morning where you're asking yourself, is there a God? Now, why is this so important to us today? Because as Taylor and many others look at our culture, they, they've come to this conclusion that modern man is in desperate need of God. Something outside of the physical realm, a deep yearning and longing for a better world. But again, if we, if we buy into this idea that there is no God and that we're just here by chance, what's this thing that rattles around in us that feels like there should be a better world? What's our reasoning that there should be a better world? You see, we've been looking at the book of Genesis and the creation, and this is the creation of the cosmos, the universe, everything. And, and what we've seen from the beginning is that there was a better world. There was something more. That in the beginning, God created everything good and that it was in perfect order and harmony. But then, like I said, came the fall in Genesis 3, and we've looked at that in this series. And now Genesis 6, we come to this point where humanity is on this downward spiral because of what we talked about, sin. You know, we ask ourselves, well, what is sin? What is the root of sin? Well, it's that middle letter I. It's all about me. Let me cut God out of my life. I don't need God. And so it's all about me, sin. And so Oz Guinness says it like this. He says, through our disobedience to God, we've been alienated from God in his presence. So now we live east of Eden. We are away from the home we were given to live in. We are all prodigals now. We are all in a far country. Yet however far we go, there is always a longing for home that will not go away. We have been cut off, so there is always a homesickness that no other home can satisfy, a desire that no other satisfaction can fulfill. We are in need of hope. And so our text today is Genesis 6, 1 through 8. And as we look at this story, it's a little strange. There's some things that are said that are like, what does that even mean? I mean, probably some of you who have been reading through the CBR journal and reading through the book of Genesis are saying, what is that? Right? Like there's parts of it that, that don't make sense to us. And so we need to ask, what's the setting for the story of Noah? And so as we set up the story of Noah, I'm going to give you three points uh, that help us understand the setting that Noah lived in. First, number one, it's an enchanted world. An enchanted world. Two, a violent humanity. And three, a righteous God. A righteous God. And so the first point, an enchanted world. Look at verses one through four. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they were born children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Now, what do I mean by enchanted? Well, C.S. Lewis, who started out as a skeptic, an atheist, was a professor at Oxford University, 
became a Christian. And here's what he says. He says, do not attempt to water Christianity down. There must be no pretense that you can have it with the supernatural left out. So far as I can see, Christianity is precisely the one religion from which the miraculous cannot be separated. You must frankly argue for supernaturalism from the very outset. What does he mean from the very outset? From the book of Genesis. The, the thought that God created the world, the cosmos, the, the, the thought that there is something beyond the physical realm, and we see it all throughout the book of Genesis. Right? We, can't, we can't get away from it. And again, as much as our culture and everything tries to push against it and say, that stuff's not real, go to Africa. Go to Haiti. Go to other parts of the world and tell them that the supernatural is not real, and I guarantee you they'll laugh in your face. They will, because I've been there. Right? This stuff, whether we want to believe it or not, is, is there, and the Bible talks about it. And so I want to look at verses 2 through 4 for a second. It says, the sons of God saw the daughters of man, they were attractive, and then it goes, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, then the sons of God came, they bore children to them. Now, there's so many questions about this text. There is so many questions about this. You're probably looking at that and you're saying, what is, what is this? See, it's been debated all throughout church history. And, and it starts with, first, the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Some have argued that this is um, godly men. So these are the sons of God. But, um, and that it's just kind of this natural thing where they uh, started to marry women that weren't, daughters of God that weren't Christians or believers in God. And so this is what happened, but, but that, that argument doesn't stand. Because all throughout church history, what many believe is that the sons of God were angels, fallen angels, and that they had these relationships with humans. And so that was the major consensus. Even Jewish writers wrote all the way back to the sons of God. And, and so what we see during the time of Noah was that there was a supernatural element happening within the earth that just kind of pointed to how messed up and fallen this world really is and was. And so that's, uh, that's hard for some of us to believe today. And then others of us, I mean, you say that the Bible is boring. Come on. Like, but this word for Nephilim is fallen ones or giants. Ezekiel 32, 27 talks about that. Here's the thing. I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on this. But to get some context, even of, of, of for this verse, you can look at Jude 6, 7. You can write down 1 Peter 3, 19. But as I step back, here's what I have to come to the Bible and, and understand. I'm not going to be able to get everything and know what this is. There, there are theologians that have just kind of been like this. I, we don't even understand all of this. So when you come to the Bible, you have to understand that there's, there's things in this world that are beyond putting in a test tube. And that's what we see here. There's a great podcast. If you're looking for different like questions and things like that, that you have about the Bible called Word Matters. And so if you're like, man, I got a bunch of questions kind of like this one that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on today, but I just want to know more, listen to that podcast, Word Matters. It's super helpful. But why is this in here? Why is this part in here? Why did I not just skip over this? Twofold, to show that the world is enchanted. Like, I don't see this stuff today. Well, yeah, but this is what we see in Genesis chapter 6. And so the world isn't changed. God is real. There's more to this world than you can see or explain or put in a test tube. And these stories aren't just stories. They trace us back to our beginning and our need for God. What's this whole thing in here for? Because we need God. And you have to go all the way back to the beginning and you trace all human lineage to say, okay, look at how messed up humanity is without God. This is how dark it got. 
Some of us ask, is this real? Star Wars Episode Seven. you know, there, there's the, the Force Awakens. See some fans here. And there's this part where Chewbacca and Han Solo meet Rey, who's the, 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 the hero for the first time. And her and her friend are in there and they're like, they see Chewbacca, they see Han Solo and, and she's like, Luke Skywalker, I thought he was a myth. And Han Solo looks back and says, it's true. The force, the Jedi, all of it, it's all true. And there's something in us that's like, oh yeah, yes. It's all true. I knew it. I knew it. You know what I mean? It's like, we watch a movie. No historical background. No, no like, you know, like, look in history and archaeology and all these types of things. We're like, oh man, I just believe it. There's just something in me. It's just the force. You know what I mean? We're ready to believe the force than we, more than we are the Bible. And I just want to say today, like, as we look at this, this is to show us that the world truly is the way that the Bible describes it. I had, to, I had to get to this place where I, I'm reading things and I'm like, I don't understand that. And I had to get to this place where I said, you know what? It's either God knows the world better than I do or I think I know the world better than God does. And I gotta come under that thought of like, okay, maybe God knows more than I do and maybe the Bible explains more than I thought was possible, Right? And so that's the first part. But the second part is this, to show how corrupt the world is apart from God. To show how, see, we see the fall affecting every part of creation, angels, humans, the world has just become extremely corrupt. Extremely corrupt. And so that's where it starts. But then we get to the second part, a violent humanity. Look at verse five. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, why, why is this world so violent? Emotional, physical, psychological, it's violent. It's hurtful. It says that every thought and intention of the heart was godless. It was godless. It was self centered, it was self seeking, it's it self absorbed. Humanity in heart and in action had rejected God. And, and do you know what happens when we reject God? It's chaos. It's chaos. The, the, the byproduct that we see here was violence. There's this controversial study that was recently done by scientists at Notre Dame University, and they asked, are people in big modern societies more or less violent than those that have gone before, our forebears? And this is the answer they came up with. It's neither. It's neither. Michael Price uh, wrote about it. He said, people who lived in small bands in the past and had no more proclivity toward violence than we do today. The finding based on estimates of war casualties throughout history undercuts the popular argument that humans have become a more peaceful species over time, thanks to advances in technology and governance. What he's saying here is hard for some to believe that within man, there's a violence that is there. And that as much as we try to hide it, it's still there. As much as our technology and our governance and all these things advance, it's still there. We can't shake it. This is a world that lives godless. See, and this was predicted by God back in Genesis 4 when Cain killed Abel. 
When Cain killed Abel, he says that there, there's going to be this, this repetitive thing that happens, this spiral. Violence is this natural byproduct that, that happens when we, we reject God. But what does God's presence do? Well, Oz Guinness talked about this when he talked about how the gospel came to Europe. When, when, when the message of Jesus came into Europe, here's what he said. He said that it gentled the barbarian Europeans. It gentled them. Now, what happened when, when God comes into your life? It gentles you. It, it makes you a different person. You see, what do we do to resolve the tension of anger in our hearts? Right, because what do we see with the Cain and Abel story? We see this jealousy and this bitterness that turns into anger and rage, and he kills his brother. And let's not say that stuff doesn't happen today, right? I mean, it happens all the time. But it's just this like cycle, right, that happens in his life. And so what, what do we do with that? Right, you've been wronged, you've been violated, nothing? Right, like, ah, you just need to forgive him. I mean, is that what Jesus, just, just, just forgive? What do you do with that anger? What do you do with people like Hitler that commit atrocious acts of, of violence and then he commits suicide with no judge? Right? You, you look at this, I look at this, and, and here's the thing, we need something greater than ourselves to, to stop the violence to stop the violence, to, to hold the violence accountable. We need a perfect judge. See, today, even when I say God as judge, people are like, man, that's a little hard to take in. Right, that's a little hard to take in, like God is judge, but here's the thing, he's a perfect judge. <laughs> he's a perfect judge. You know, like faulty court systems, people that get off and they it's like really clear that they did something and then they get off and there's no punishment or any of those types of things, right? We put, we put our, our hope in man. That's not gonna resolve the anger in our hearts. But God says, don't put it in the hands of man. Don't even take it into your own hands. He says, put it into my hands, my hands. Miroslav Volf, theologian, said, imagine your community is attacked, family and friends killed, atrocities done, and, and you tell the survivors, you must forgive your enemies. Volf says, your point to them, we should not retaliate, why not? Because God doesn't judge. I say the only means of prohibiting violence by us is to insist the violence is only legitimate when it comes from God. Violence thrives today, secretly nourished by the belief that God refuses to take the sword. Right, like, why was this world so violent? It's because it was, judgment was placed in the hands of man when it was only meant to be in the hands of God. Only in the hands of God. How's the only way that you can learn to forgive? It's when you say, man, at the end of the day, I'm not the judge. God is. We're all accountable to him. And so there are these people now who are looking at this violent humanity and God is this righteous God and he's looking down at all of the violence and terrible things that are happening. And so lastly, we find this, we find a righteous God. A righteous God. As, as humanity is on this downward spiral, we find a righteous God. Look at verses six through eight. It says, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There's a lot here, but what do we see? First is this, we see the pain of God. The pain of God. Look at verse six. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. This word for regretted is to groan in pain. 
God is groaning in pain as he is looking at the violence of man on the earth. And it says it grieved him. This is to hurt, like God physically hurting as he's watching humanity just spiral without him. And so what does this tell us about God? Timothy Keller says he didn't need us. God didn't need us. We saw that from the beginning. But once he made us, he knit his heart to us. He knit his heart to us. I don't know what a righteous God looks like. It says in Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Why? Right, so there is this God who's pleading with humanity Right, like you don't see it all through here, but God is pleading with humanity as he looks down on humanity, violent humanity, pleading because of his grace. He says, I don't want to bring judgment on you. See, how does this change your view about God? Do Do you see God suffering as he looks upon humanity? Nicholas Wolterstorff, a philosopher at Yale University, says this. He says, the tears of God are the meaning of history. If you don't see God suffering for our sins, you don't know what history is all about. He's saying that as you look at history all throughout, as you look at the scriptures all throughout, there is a God who is suffering on the other end. Why? Because he cares so deeply for humanity. He cares so deeply for you and me. And so what's next? We see grace. Because here's what really humanity deserved, right? Like we deserve to be blotted out. We deserve to be wiped out. Like that's, that's, like for some of us here today, we say, I'm really patient. I'm a really kind guy. I'm a really loving person. All of these types of things. not even close to what God is. Yet God is at this point where he says, this is the deserved punishment. But then we see this, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now what's this word for favor? In the Old Testament, it's the same word that we find in the New Testament for grace. He found grace. He found this undeserved love from God. He found grace. See, what does this this all point to? That there's hope. As dark as the world got and as much right as God had to destroy everything and everyone, instead he chose to have grace. See, many of us today would ask, why did God only save Noah and his family? But as we think on God for a minute and just understanding that God's way different than me and he knows a whole lot more than me and he was there and I wasn't. (laughs) We see his grief. We see what he was willing to go through. We should ask, why did God save humanity at all? (laughs) Why did he save humanity at all? It was grace. And we will look at this more next week. We're gonna walk through this story of Noah and the flood and all of those things. And if you ask me, do you believe it? Yeah, I do. I do. And so we're gonna walk through that together next week. But just some takeaways. What can we learn from this text today? Number one, take seriously God's holiness. Take seriously God's holiness. Do do you see what this passage is all about? What it is, it's it's showing this gap between us and God. There's this huge gap, right? Like us modern people, we have a very low view of God. In many ways, we think that God is like us. He's like me. And in many ways, we think that we have all the answers. Or I demand, or I deserve to have all the answers, right? Right? But if there's a God in heaven that's far above me, that knows 
vastly more than me, then I have to come to this God and say, there are things that I don't understand and may never understand. And he'd be okay with that. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. I had a conversation with a student last week. And he's been, we've been talking and having some conversation. And one of the things he came up to me and said, he said, he said, I stopped questioning some of the things that I just don't think I'll ever be able to understand. And I'm asking for help to believe. I'm asking for help to believe. And in some ways, that's, that's kind of where we start. It doesn't mean we don't ask questions. We should. We should. Keep asking. If you've got doubts, keep coming. Right? Keep exploring. That's a good thing. But we got to know that if there's a God who knows vastly more than us, then we're, ne- not, we're not going to be able to explain and understand all of his ways. It's not going to be able to, to be possible. So take seriously God's holiness and who he is. The second point, start with God's grace. And I'll add dot, 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 not your goodness. Start with God's grace, not your goodness. You know, a lot of the times, many times what we do is we approach God based on our own goodness. God, look at all the things I've done. Look at who I am. Look at how I've cleaned up my life. And so surely you've got to accept me. But I just want you to know that that's not the good news. And it's really not good news because when I think about it for my own life, I think, man, I, if that's how it works, I, I, got, I don't have a chance. I don't have a chance. Right? There are so many things that rattle around in my heart and my mind. It's just like, I, I don't know how to clean that up. Lord, help me. That's, that's the thing, right? Get angry about this. Get upset about this prideful about this, right? There are things, again, that we're just not putting out there on Instagram and Facebook that's just rattling around in our hearts. Because if I were to ask some of us and say, hey, who, has, who, who wants to volunteer this week? We're going to put your whole week up on the screen and we're just going to say, hey, you just had a great week. You're a really good person, right? You want, anybody want to volunteer to have their whole life up this week, just this week, up on the screen for everybody to see? Probably not. Probably not. Right? And so that's the thing that we're talking about here. It's, but that's not how God is inviting us to come into relationship with him. This passage is pointing us to the opposite. People during Noah's day were sinful, but God is pointing us to the need for his grace. For his grace. Like I need God's loving grace. Jerry Bridges says this. He says, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. What's that mean? Every single day, I need to know that there's a God who loves me despite me. Despite me. And that I couldn't work hard enough or I couldn't be good enough to come into his presence. See, some of us think it's this, that we got to work our way up to God. But the message of the Bible and what we see in Jesus and who Jesus is, is that he worked his way down to me. He worked his way down to me. That's when we talk. We're talking about God becoming a man. God becoming man. Like that, that again, hard to understand. I, I can't explain all the ins and outs of that. But do I believe it? Yes. Why? Because I need it. And you need it and we all need it. I love it when C.S. Lewis said, you know, he's like, you want to know why I believe the Bible? He says, because no person could ever make this stuff up. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, hold on. You, you, so it's just free grace? Like, God loves me not because of anything I've done, but that's what every other religion in the world says. It's only in Christianity that you find a God who says, no, believe in everything that's been done for you. Believe in everything that Jesus has done for you. And it's purely by grace that you come into his presence. Only religion in the world. Only one. By faith. 
should shatter a lot of our categories, right? See, the point of the Bible is this, that God is the only hero. And um, I was talking with one uh, guy about this, you know, um, he's like, man, I'm reading through some of the Old Testament. Some of this stuff is just crazy. It's crazy, like just what happens, how dark things get. I said, you know what? Um, the Bible is descriptive, not prescriptive in the Old Testament, some of these. It's descriptive in the sense that it's describing things that happened apart from God, right? We just start like, he's like, why is Lamech got two wives? Is that like, I told him, it's not prescriptive. God already said what marriage was at the beginning. But now we got Lamech over here trying to reinvent marriage. Okay, and so that, that's like, that's, that's what happens. We get away from God's ways, we start to reinvent things in our own image. We start to do things our own way. And so again, start with God's grace. Start with what he's done, and then he's gonna draw you in and show you things that this is what life was meant to be. All right, last, God, see God's heart. Do you see his grief? Ephesians 4.30 says, do, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We were having a great conversation in men's uh, group a couple weeks ago. I said, do you, do, you, do you understand that you can grieve God? Like, that's just strange to me, right? Like, like that I can grieve God. But then I said, think about it like this. It's, it's like I've got three kids. And there are things that my kids do when I watch them and it's, it's really only hurting them, right? Like it's, it's gonna hurt them. But you know what it does? My heart is so tied into them that it grieves me. That it grieves me. And so when God looks at you as his child and he sees you going off on this path where you're saying it's all about me and it's all about what I wanna do and you're hurting yourself, do you know that God's saying my heart is so tied up with you that it grieves me and it hurts me? That's the God we serve. See, it causes him pain. And when I understand that, instead of running away from what God wants for my life, I start to run to what God wants for my life. Right, it's not like this, oh, bringing down the hammer, so that's what's really gonna change me. Maybe sometimes, yeah, but really a lot of it is gonna be through that relationship of just knowing that I'm hurting the heart of God. And so I'm going back and running towards him saying, this is what you want from me, God. And so I'm gonna run towards that and then you find fulfillment in life. Famous secular therapist and author Rollo May he tells in his book, My Quest for Beauty, about a time when he visited a Greek Orthodox monastery. And they were celebrating Easter. He had recently been recovering from a nervous breakdown. And at the height of the Easter service, the people began to say, Christ is risen. May himself even said it. And then he said this, I was seized then by the moment, a moment of spiritual reality. What it, would it mean for the world if he had truly risen? What would it mean for the world if he had truly risen? What would it mean if, if God became man, lived a perfect life, died for my sins, rose from the dead, and says what he says on the cross, it is finished. That work, that striving to clean up your life, to become a good person, all of those things, I've nailed it all to the cross and all you've gotta do is come to me, come to the foot of the cross, receive me for what I've done. What if it's true? That's the greatest hope we could ever have. You see, what was it that Noah had when it said that he had grace. Because in the next verse, it says that he was a, a righteous person. Well, what we see, the whole message of the Bible, it's, it's cohesive, is that righteousness only comes from God himself. 
wasn't righteous because he was just better. You're going to see it in Genesis 9. You'll be like, that's Noah? The only time he talks in the Bible, that's what he says? And that's what he does? Okay. Righteous man? Only because of God. God's the only hero. And so today, if you're struggling, you're saying, man, I just need some hope. I see this wickedness all around. I see these things all around me and I've just kind of fallen into it myself. I just want you to know that there's hope in Jesus Christ. All the way back in the book of Genesis, we see it and it's offered to you today. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you work in our lives. There are things that we just don't understand. And, and, and so we come to you, Lord. I just confess I, I'm no expert. I'm just a servant of yours. I just want to be faithful to your text and to your word, Lord. I pray that you speak and you help us to understand. Open our eyes to things that we just don't see right now. Help us to know that you're there. I know there are people that are here today that are searching and just saying, are you there, God? I need to know. And I pray that you show yourself for who you are and show your heart for, for the people here today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, today... Um, there's another opportunity. On the side, we have our care team that would love to talk with you, pray with you through anything that you're going through. And here's the thing. I'm going to hang out at the end down here. And if you've got any questions or things that you want to work through, talk through, I'll try to answer those or point you in the right direction. But we are here to serve you. We're here to point you to God. And so this morning, uh, we would love to talk with you. So again, our care team, if you don't know who Jesus is, you've never accepted him, as your Lord and Savior, you say, man, I want to know more about that. That's why we're here. Um, and then today, I want to invite you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, one of the things we do every week is we remember him by taking um, the bread and the juice, uh, remembering his broken body and his blood that was spilt for us. Um, it's the reason why today I can say, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's not because I got my life together. It's because Jesus came, died, and covers my life. And so that's what I remember every week. Remember it every week, right? And so this time like, of re is a time of reflection. It's like a self-examination. Kind of like, what does this look like? Like, where am I at right now? And God, I want you to speak to me. And so I encourage you, you know, there's people around you. You can take that together. You can take communion together. You can take it on your own. Um, but when you're ready uh, today as a believer in Christ, I invite you to come up. If you're not a believer, just, you know, hang out where you're at and just take some time, pray. And just kind of say, like, what's holding me back? What's holding me back from becoming a Christian? What's holding me back from believing in God? You know, and we, again, we want to be here to help walk with you through all of that. So the care team's on the side and communion's up front when you're ready.
sing of his faithfulness. Your love 
stand firm through all my life. Sing in my search. In my search. Oh God, you near in my wandering. Oh God, you near when I feel alone. Oh God, you near at my lowest. God, you near when oh God. You never leave my side Your love Will stand firm through all my life Apart, we are joined as one by the blood, and hope will rise as we become more than conquerors through the one who loved the world. High Lord, death, no. Pull us apart, we are joined as one by the blood. And hope will rise as we become one, we conquer through the praise today. All right. You know, as we end service today, uh, in a few weeks, our church is going to be sending out our first ever mission trip to Ecuador. Um, yeah, give it up. Yes. We got 12 going, and uh, we were able to be a part of planting a church in Loja, Ecuador in 2015 through Compassion International. Now, some of you have helped uh, support some of the, the kids that live there in that community, and uh, Brooke's going to get to go there in a few weeks. So, Brooke, do you want to share a little bit about what you guys are doing? Yeah, so um, if you sponsor a kid, which you would probably know who you are if you do that, um, 
we are gonna go and get to meet those children that our church sponsors, which is so cool. Um, and we get to go into the homes of these families and get to meet the families and just get to bless them with encouragement, but also with tangible gifts. Um, and so if you sponsor a kid and you would like us to hand deliver a gift or a card or whatever you know you feel compelled to give to your child, uh, we get to do that. Um, and so if, it'd be awesome if you could like take a picture of you and like write a note to your, your child. Um, and they, Compassion recommended putting some gifts in a backpack um, because that's a practical need and also just like a kind of cool way to wrap the gift. Um, and so if you have a kid and you would like t- for us to deliver something, um, let me know. And we're gonna have a table after service next week. And um, I believe the week after that, because I think we're still here yet. Um, and so we'll collect those and we will bring those with us. Um, and so talk with me if you need ideas for what to, to give as gifts. Um, and also just be consider, considerate of like size um, because we do have limited space that we can pack. Um, so just, yeah, so if you have questions about that, you can talk to me. We're gonna have tables after service the next two weeks and you can drop that off, so. Yeah, you know, uh, before we planted that church there, I was able to go to Ecuador, see uh, what God is doing through Compassion International, and it's amazing, amazing work. Um, and one of the things that they said, you know, like for me and my family, we got two kids that we sponsor, and they said, you know, more than the money, the relationship with the sponsor is one of the most life-changing things for the child. Uh, that is receiving these gifts. And so you can do that on the app. I don't know if you have the Compassion app if you are a sponsor, but you can go in there. It's super easy, and you can write a, a letter uh, right on the app. Um, so it's, I, I encourage you, I highly encourage you to, to do that um, and to build that relationship um, because, again, this is um, really impacting this community uh, for the gospel for eternity. So thank you for what you're doing, the support that you give. Um, so if we could just end the service. Uh, we're going to pray for Brooke, the team. We're going to be coming up here before. We've got to send you guys out too with another prayer. But we're just going to pray for the kids and the community in Loja as well. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, Father, I just thank you for the way that you're putting this trip together, the way that you've used Brooke as the leader of this trip um, to, to bring everyone together uh, to, to really plan something that's going to be great for these kids, um, for the families, for the community, Lord. I just pray that there's, um, there's an excitement, uh, but there's also just um, a prayerfulness as um, this team goes. And... Um, that it makes a spiritual impact on the community there. Um, It just shows that, God, you are alive, that you are real, that you have changed our lives and that we want to share your love with the world. And we pray for all the kids and families that are being sponsored through this church. We thank you for the impact that's being made in Ecuador. And uh, we just pray that it will continue to expand and to grow um, so that more and more lives are changed. Uh, We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Grace City, I'll be right over here if you want to ask any questions or anything. I'd love to hang out and meet you. Um, Have a great week. You're sent.